Coming up on DTNS, Windows 11 acts like old Microsoft when it comes to browsers. Waymo's trucking arm expands on the I-10 corridor and why BlackBerry became an example of bad corporate security instincts. DTNS starts now. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, August 18th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. In wet Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And in drizzly uh, Southern California, I'm Roger Jane, the show's producer. We were just talking about old-timey TV shows and why they didn't have a narrative arc. If you'd like that wider conversation, become a member. Get our expanded show, Good Day Internet, at patreon.com slash DTNS, where you can join our top patrons like Eric Holm, Carmine Bailey, and John and Becky Johnston. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Two stories released to Apple's security policies today. One, Germany D Digital Agenda Committee Chief Manuel Hoferlin wrote a letter to Apple CEO Tim Cook asking the company to reconsider its CSAM filtering plans. Also, Apple has appealed a copyright decision it lost to Corellium, which makes simulated iPhone software that security researchers and others may use to examine how the devices function. Apple makes a version of its software available to security researchers, but it is more restricted than what Corellium offers. Apple settled most of the claims with Corellium out of court. Now on to Intel. They're planning to shut down its RealSense computer vision division in an effort to focus on its core chip business. RealSense's portfolio includes stereoscopic, LiDAR, and coded light cameras across various form factors. Intel said it will continue to meet commitments already made to existing RealSense customers. Apple announced its share play feature will not ship with the initial release of iOS 15. It's been disabled in the iOS developer beta 6. Company made a share play development profile available for devs to keep working on integration. Uh, this is the one where you can watch something along with somebody else on FaceTime. Company plans to release the feature in a software update later this fall. Nikkei Asia's sources say the surge in COVID-19 has slowed down Apple, Google, and Amazon's shift to production from China to Vietnam. Google Pixel 6 and Apple's latest AirPods and upcoming MacBooks were reportedly intended to shift to, to Vietnam for production. Uh, smart home products from Amazon recently shifted to Viet Vietnam as well and have also faced delays due to a surge in cases of the virus. T-Mobile confirmed 7.8 million current users and more than 40 million past or prospective customers who applied for credit had information stolen in a data leak. This data included names, date of birth, driver's license, and social security numbers. It did not include phone numbers, account numbers, pins, or passwords. However, a different leak included 850,000 prepaid customers, and that one did include pins. And those pins have since been reset. The company is offering impacted parties two years of identity protection services. Wow, that's pretty good. All right, let's talk about trucking. Yeah, got let's a convoy. do it. Let's do it. I got way more info about Waymo's autonomous trucking arm. By the way, this is not an arm that uh, hangs out of the side of your truck. We're talking about that part of their business. Waymo Via, up. it's called. Uh, it's building a trucking hub in partnership with RIDAR in Dallas, Texas. The company has been testing its Waymo driver platform on Class 8 trucks with companies like J.B. Hunt on Interstate 45 between Houston and Fort Worth down there in Texas. The new hub that is building or that it's building will help Waymo via expand operations beyond I-45 onto I-10, I-20, and connect with Waymo's Phoenix operations. I am telling you the day that I went and saw uh, Logan in movie theaters, and I saw those autonomous driving trucks. I thought that is a reality I can get my head around. And Tom, we're finally heading toward Logan Town. Yeah, uh, blow the horn. Uh, I think I, I think uh, Waymo Via may be the more commercially viable part of Waymo before its passenger car service is. Even though they're offering commercial passenger car service in Phoenix, it's very limited. It has not been expanding. There's even been some scuttlebutt that some of the engineers are leaving Waymo uh, on the vehicle side. But Waymo Via seems to be trucking along real strong here. Uh, and, and that seems to be industry-wide. We are seeing trucking, logistics-oriented autonomous uh, vehicles leading the way uh, in commercial viability. This indicates, I mean, the partnership with Ryder is smart. Uh, Ryder's uh, got a huge fleet. Uh, and so part of this will be fleet maintenance and, and making sure that, that the trucks are good. And as they are able to ramp up autonomous trucks, they'll just go right into that fleet. Um, you still need some humans on board. Uh, so they'll, they'll be able to draw from, from that pool uh, because these are not 
level five autonomous trucks. In fact, I think it's uh, with Daimler that that Waymo Via is is investigating level four autonomous trucks. Uh, level four means you still need some human supervision. Uh, they and they have to be on predetermined routes. They can't just go driving all over the place uh, on their own. Uh, but when you're talking about trucks, you stick them on a controlled access highway like the interstate system in the United States, uh, and they do really well. Uh, yeah. And it, and it's more efficient. It does seem like. Uh... I mean, you're, it's not quite as the cry, uh, crow flies when you're talking about these routes, but it does make a lot more sense than an average driver who's just in a car and how many stops they might make and how many random decisions they might have to make. This is just load it up and send it. So for now, people in there until we get to a further certification. But my question is, should that industry start worrying about, you know, job loss? This is one of those questions that always comes up. I tend to to, to lean into the idea that, Oftentimes we don't see it right away, but these kinds of innovations lead to other and better jobs, maybe even in the same industry, maybe to support these new initiatives, whatever. But, you know, it's easy to look at this if you're a driver or otherwise involved in that industry and go, oh, great, computers are going to take over the freight business. What are we going to do? Well, you know? and, and this is one of those industries that's worth paying attention to because in general, people overreact to automation. Automation doesn't necessarily lead to job loss. We've talked about it before. Bringing in computers and putting a bunch of secretaries out of work uh, did not lead to you know years and years of, of, of secretaries out panhandling. It meant that you could now hire those same people for other jobs and provide services that you couldn't before. Uh, I, ideally, uh, we will see improved customer service because companies who cheap out on customer service won't have to because they'll be saving all this money on automation. However, in trucking, you don't have as much of a clear path to transferable skills. Uh, so eventually when you're like, yeah, these trucks can drive themselves, they don't even need a person on board, a truck driver can't go like, oh, well, so I've got an obvious place to go and now provide benefit to the company that they couldn't afford before. Uh, so that that is something to get ahead of now as this ramps up is like, how are you going to help truck drivers transition to other jobs? The other jobs will be there, but they may require some retraining. They may require some skills. This this could be an area where, the, where it has a bigger impact, I think. All right, time for another China crackdown update. Crack. Tencent's WeChat was listed in a government notice Wednesday. Uh, the government of China accused 43 apps of illegally transferring contact lists and location data. Uh, WeChat, of course, a super app uh, in, in China used for everything. That's a big one. Alibaba's e-reader was on this list. Aichi Yi was also on this list. Uh, that's a video service. The apps have until August 25th to fix the issues. Uh, China is set to pass its new data privacy law this week. This is China's version of the GDPR, although with more provisions for government access, uh, whereas the GDPR usually applies to governments and private companies. Tuesday, the government issued new draft guidelines on anti-competitive practices that forbid blocking a competitors' products from platforms, forbids paying cash for fake reviews, and forbids taking competitor data and more. Uh, this is very similar to other anti-competitive rules being considered in other parts of the world. China's President Xi also announced Tuesday that he encourages, quote, high income individuals and businesses to do more to repay society. This is where you need a little Kremlinology or Politburoology or whatever you call it in China, <laughs> uh, which people are taking this to mean, hey, big tech bigwigs making a lot of money. You need to just come up with things to do to keep me from coming at you. Uh, still, Tencent posted a 29 percent rise in Q2 profit. It's gaming revenue, which is under fire, slowed a little. Also, I think people are just not gaming as much as, as they tended to go back out uh, after lockdowns. Uh, but fintech picked up the slack. Tencent doubled its overseas revenue in 2020 to 7% of total sales. Still small, but that may be a pathway forward for Tencent is to do a lot more overseas. In the earnings call, Tencent President Martin Lau warned investors to expect more regulations from China but noted that, quote, regulation of the Internet is a global trend, and it's not just limited to China. It's actually happening in the U.S., in Europe. But China is really a bit ahead in terms of the execution of the more structural regulation framework. First in regulation! <laughs> Martin Lau's like, China, China. Uh, Lau also said, from our understanding, the government actually wants to foster a long-term sustainable development of the Internet industry. Uh, basically, I read that to mean like, dear government, look at us. We're going to be a team player. 
Uh, Lau also said, our attitude during this wave of regulation, we want to embrace this environment fully and we want to establish ourselves as fully compliant. Please. Uh, Also good news for Baidu. You may think of Baidu as like the big search engine in China, which it is. Uh, But Baidu is trying to change that perception a little bit, announcing a second generation AI chip. The Kunlun 2 can be used for autonomous driving and has entered mass production. Uh, that's music to President Xi's ear because that's what he wants people to do. Shift a little of that energy off the social platforms onto hardware. Start making some chips domestically. Baidu also showed off a concept robocar and redesigned its taxi app with ambitions of making autonomous taxis available commercially in some cities within the next couple of years. Baidu also announced four new products with its smart voice assistant in them, including a smart screen and TV. So Baidu has got the message like, yeah, if we have a platform, the search engine, sure, but look at all the hardware we're making. Uh, we're making chips domestically, like trying to win points. Yeah, uh, I kind of, when you mentioned this earlier in prep and even again here, um, that's my biggest takeaway here is it feels like they don't think they're, well, they, meaning the government, don't necessarily think sustainability and strength comes in the form of TikTok came up or is over here and all these social services and we got huge gaming companies and these services and internet sort of social networks are not the long game. The long game is a little bit more traditional. If you think about it, it's us making actual stuff that the rest of the world is going to want, that we're going to want, and will make us, you know, more viable everywhere. And I think that's probably, probably true. Um, We can have all kinds of conversations and arguments about how they get there. And if this regulation is actually healthy in the long run or, or, or whatever, Um, there's a lot of, you know, political stuff around that as well. But at the end of the day, I think I kind of agree with this idea of you can't, it can't all just be, is everyone using us to search? Is everybody using us to post their videos? And is everybody using us to talk to each other? Those are cool. And I think you can still have those and they certainly already do in a very major way. Um, But if I were them, if I were any government, I would try to push toward, I don't know, a more hardware based, actual tangible based sort of, uh, change to that kind of, uh, you know, the technology space in my country. So I don't know. It's hard to argue with. Uh, let me argue with it then. Argue. <laughs> Cause the problem is, uh, that's not where the demand is. And there are lots of companies who do it way better than you. Uh, China's not really expecting to market to the rest of the world. They'd love that. But first, they'd like self-sufficiency. They 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 would like Huawei to be able to build a Huawei phone uh, without having to rely on the United States. And they've got years to go before that happens. Uh, usually, you let the market decide. Even China lets the market decide in technology where the money should go. What President Xi is doing now is really worrying investors, worldwide investors in Chinese companies, because he's saying, I'm not going to let the market decide anymore. I'm going to decide. And I'm going to decide that they spend money on something that the investors have thought others do better. And that has investors really getting cold, saying like, okay, so you're hurting the business that's doing well, and you want them to pour money into the business that they haven't been competitive in. Doesn't sound like a good business plan to me. I think I'll drop my stock. And you've seen stock, even with these good revenue numbers, uh, dropping for a lot of these Chinese companies because of that. Well, it'll be uh, interesting to pay attention to that one. Uh, You'll follow all of that stuff right on this show. All right, let's talk about BlackBerry. You know, the phones, remember them? Well, it's not really phones anymore. They're now a security and industrial software company. They announced Tuesday the discovery of BattleLock, a vulnerability in its QNX operating system. QNX is used in cars, factory, machinery, medical devices. You could even find this stuff on the International Space Station, which is pretty cool. Other companies like Microsoft announced and patched the BattleLock vulnerability in May. So you might ask yourself, why did it take BlackBerry so long to address this thing? Well, Politico sources say BlackBerry initially denied BattleLock's affected or that it did affect QNX. Although U.S. Uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, believed it did. So when CISA finally uh, convinced them, BlackBerry, they created a patch, like you think they might. But said it preferred to reach out to customers privately to warn them of the flaw rather than make a public announcement. Except <laughs> BlackBerry also admitted it didn't have a complete list of everybody that used QNX. Um, because BlackBerry licenses QNX to be included in products that it doesn't necessarily sell or doesn't sell at all. Politico says CISA has uh, had to create a PowerPoint to explain to BlackBerry what might happen if they didn't publicly tell everybody about this vulnerability. 
And the head of CISA Cyber Division, Eric Goldstein, said this, while we are not aware of any active exploitation, we encourage users of QNX to review the ad, uh, excuse me to review the ad advisory BlackBerry put out today and implement mitigation measures, including patching systems as quickly as possible. Unquote. He did not comment on BlackBerry's delay in the announcement. Oh boy, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's I I can feel the anger already uh, uh, of of several people in the audience against BlackBerry. But before uh, you you tar BlackBerry uh, <laughs> with with your brush. Uh, keep in mind that there go so many other companies that you don't hear about all the time because they didn't have CISA on their back because the security vulnerability wasn't as high profile. Uh, this this is high profile because QNX is in everything. It's an embedded system. It's in ATMs. It's in uh, factory controlling. And that's why BlackBerry didn't have a comprehensive list of who's using it because BlackBerry provides QNX to other OEMs who make products and BlackBerry doesn't have their customer lists. It just knows like, oh yeah, we they, they pay us uh, for using QNX. So what was going on here is the old fashioned way of thinking of like, well, we don't want the bad guys to know the vulnerability is out there, except that it was revealed in May that it's out there. So even though you didn't say it was in QNX then, the bad guys were looking at QNX to see if it also was there. Uh, that never works. Usually the bad guys will find it anyway. Second was, we didn't want the embarrassment, you know? We wanted to go privately to our clients, say, hey, you need to fix this, but we don't want the blowback because we're a security company and we don't want to look bad. Those days are over. Every company has these things. And what makes you look bad is not confronting it. The modern way, the 2021 way is to go like, hey, good news, we found a vulnerability, here's how to fix it. We don't think it's actively exploited. Everybody get on it, okay? Good job team, we found the vulnerability, which is what Microsoft and others did back in May. So uh, th this is, it's not good news in that it's it's BlackBerry not moving with the times and and acting old fashioned, but they're not the only ones. It's a corporate culture thing that that really just needs to be stamped out. It's, it's probably worth mentioning too that, um you know, there is a mindset. If this was, if you told me this company was Technotronics Incorporated LLC.com or whatever, and they had this vulnerability, I'd go, oh, interesting. Okay, well, it uh, sounds like everyone's on it. They're going to have to deal with it and ceases all over them and all this. But because it's BlackBerry, our brains go, kink, it's BlackBerry. And it's fun to hate on them because they sure, boy, they sure have screwed up back in the day. And now look at them screwing up again. Like there's a little bit of that mentality yeah, going on. Yeah. And it's hard to avoid, but yeah. Well, folks, if you try to hide the BlackBerry patch, you end up in a thorny situation. <laughs> All next week is DTNS Experiment Week. While much of the world vacations in the summer, we're swapping out our normal DTNS show and trying out some new show ideas hosted by DTNS producers and contributors. Uh, so instead of just taking the show down for a summer vacation, uh, we're going to give you a Chris Ashley barbecue tech show, a Jen Cutter state of video gaming, Rob Dunwood with a second look at tech, Rich Strafalino's Ask a Luddite, and a few more. It all starts next week, Monday, August 23rd, right here on the DTNS feeds. This story is going to make you feel like it's 1999. Oh, Windows 11 is changing how users manage the default browser. When you install a new browser, the first time you click on a link, you'll still be given a choice to select a browser and always use this app. That hasn't changed from Windows 10. However, here's what has changed. If a browser prompts you to make it the default, or you just plunge into the settings yourself, things will be more complicated. In Windows 10 right now, you go to settings, you go to apps, and you choose default apps from a bunch of categories. One of those categories is web, and under web, you can choose from any installed browser or look for an app in the Microsoft Store. Pretty simple. Here's one downside to consider. When you choose that as the default, it doesn't change the setting for all extensions, just most of them. Remember that, keep that in mind, because that goes part way to explaining why Microsoft is doing this. In Windows 11, the categories are gone. When you go into default settings, it doesn't say email, web, et cetera. Instead, you choose an app. It's a list of apps and you can search, choose an app, and then go in and assign that app to defaults by extension type. For browsers, you're given multiple options, HTML, HTML, HTML PDF, SHTML, SVG, WebP, XHT, XHTML, FTP, HTTP, and HTTPS. So if you wanna change your default browser from settings, you have to make that a browser the default for each type. 
And even when you've changed all those, you'll get a message saying, hey, before you switch, try Microsoft Edge. It's fast, secure, and built for Windows 11. You're going to get nagged. Microsoft describes this as giving customers control of defaults. A Microsoft spokesperson told The Verge it's meant to let users, quote, customize and control defaults at a more granular level, eliminating app categories and elevating all apps to the forefront of the defaults experience. And granted, Ars Technica pointed out, SHTML not handled in Windows 10 when you change the default web app. So this is giving you that control right up front. The Verge's Tom Warren found that Firefox has already adapted to this. And so when you go into Firefox and say, make this the default browser, it handles it for you without you having to go into the default app settings. But none of the other browsers have done that yet. And even when you've gone to the trouble to change the defaults, it isn't always respected. Windows 10 already ignored the default browser in search and the taskbar widget. And Windows 11 ignores the default browser choice in all widgets and search, sending all users to Microsoft Edge for those. So a lot of people frustrated scott uh about this one yeah my first feeling is okay i like i like my extensions to be proper you know to work well uh whatever that may mean if i install something new on a computer and it just kind of knows well i should be the the king of your pdfs now um i kind of like that i don't have to dink with it i kind of know i installed it for that reason and it's going to work and if i want to go change it i can i can change you know where things go now this is a lot of extensions they're all web not all but they're very web centric extensions right and because the chances are makes sense. i'd kind of like an all or not let me be granular Bingo. that's fine yeah but let me have a switch that says i would like all of these to default to firefox or chrome or whatever it is i'm choosing or all of them to edge um that's why i don't necessarily buy their whole we're giving you more power and more tools and more whatever you're giving us more busy work if we truly want to like avoid edge and use something else. I happen to think edge is pretty good right now and a decent choice for a desktop operating system or a desktop browser solution. That aside, I don't like this feeling of like, well, it's sort of all set for that now, but if you want to use something else, you better come in here and really noodle around in the details. I think you're asking a lot. Of yeah. People. I, re remember, uh, Microsoft is not a person. There's not Bob Microsoft that sat down and, <laughs> and, and made this policy. Uh, Microsoft is a lot of people. Are there employees of Microsoft who feel like, you know what, the more we can nudge people to use Edge, the better, and maybe they'll get frustrated, but whatever. Yes, there likely are. But there are also engineers who thought this literally, like I, I believe thought like, no, this is better. Give them, give, give people control over this. Let's put it in the beta, see how it works and we can adjust from there. So hopefully what happens is those engineers rule the day uh, and they are able to hear Scott and go like, oh, you just want to select all? Yeah, great. Yeah, we can put that in there. Or make it even easier. Bring back the categories and let me say, I'll let you handle it or I'll click here to customize, which granted is more like what Windows 10 was doing. So maybe they don't want to do that. But if this, if you're, if you're, it's time to call Microsoft on their bluff. If your idea was like, we put it out there to hear what people think and we'll adjust, adjust. We, there's lots of us who don't like this and want an easier way to set a default browser. Yeah, right. I, I agree. And there may yeah. not be a Bob Microsoft, but there is a Microsoft Bob. <laughs> there was. There certainly was. Uh, good news, you guys. Uh, sit back and relax because Snob OS's Nika Montford is back to spotlight another black tech entrepreneur. Take it away. Hi, this is Nika Monford of the Snob West Show, back with another episode of Teching While Black. In this segment, I bring awareness to an innovative Black leader in technology. This week's spotlight is on Vanessa Weich, the first Black woman to lead a NASA center. She will serve as the 13th director of the Johnson Space Center, where she will spearhead space flight missions, the International Space Station Mission Operations, and the Orion Program. A native of South Carolina, she earned a Bachelor of Science in Materials Engineering and a Master of Science in Bioengineering from Clemson University. No stranger to the NASA community, she is a 30-year veteran of NASA. She began her career at NASA in 1989 as an engineer who managed several space shuttle missions. Among numerous prestigious awards which she's earned, two NASA Outstanding Leadership Medals and two NASA Achievement Medals are both in the rank. As I've said many times before, history is truly being made 
in real time every single day. So today we celebrate Vanessa Weich in the here and now. To find out more about her and her work, you can follow her on Twitter at V underscore Weich. Join me next time as I highlight another Black tech innovator. When we are aware of all innovative voices, especially those in underrepresented groups, the tech community thrives. Thank you, Nika. Oh, Vanessa Weich is impressive. I've been to Johnson Space Center before. You have? Uh, yeah. Did you think uh, of me while you were there? Well, I hadn't met you yet. It <laughs> okay. was a long time ago. So. <laughs> uh, but I do now when I think right. back on it. Uh, fusion energy is an area of intense research because it involves creating energy from pushing atoms together rather than splitting them apart. That results in much less of a chance for explosions uh, and less toxic waste. It's generally quite a bit safer uh, and, and, and better for the environment uh, than nuclear fission. Uh, we can fuse atoms all day long. That part isn't a problem. The big barrier is ignition, basically getting a reaction that sustains itself and produces more energy than you put into it. Science Magazine reports that scientists at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory aimed 192 laser beams at a sphere of deuterium and tritium housed in a gold cylinder. The shots vaporized the gold, which produced X-rays that imploded the capsule and sparked a sustained fusion reaction for 20 nanoseconds. Oh. Yeah. Not terribly long, but hey, we did better than we've ever done. And they put in 1.9 megajoules to make it happen and got out 1.35. So about 70%. <laughs> they didn't they didn't get more out yet than they put in. But before you start Raz and Lawrence Livermore Lab, that's eight times better than the lab had managed before. And it puts them much closer to achieving full ignition. Of course, there's the matter of how you sustain it for more than 20 nanoseconds and all of that to follow. But hey, getting closer, right? Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's super cool. You know, we I feel like you and I, since maybe our high school years, have been told that cold fusion's on its way. We're going to find a way to do this. It's all going to happen. And this is as close as we've got. And hey, if you got to vaporize a little gold once in a while, what's the harm? Yep. Uh, this is hot fusion, by the way. This is oh yeah, I, sh fusion. I should not call this cold fusion, but yeah, cold remember fusion that it was like the cup. great. It was like he the did great it in unicorn. a coffee cup. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's never gonna yeah. happen. That was around the time I went to the Johnson Space Center. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's check out the mailbag. Nathaniel in Salcom says, "Hey folks, first off, you're doing a great job on the show. Thank you, Nathaniel. I'm looking to buy my first 3D printer, and I realized been a while since I've heard anything on DTNS on this topic." How about a roundup of where things are in the industry and a look at where the tech was a few years ago and where it could go next? Also looking forward to the great August Experimental Week. Nathaniel, thank you. I'm glad you're looking forward to Experiment Week. This is a great question. Uh, 3D printers have not been in the tech news, and I have a few th reasons why I think that is. A lot of the 3D printing investment and innovation is happening at the industrial level. So you're getting a lot of like 3D printing food, 3D printing industrial parts that's happening. And it's not at the consumer level that you can buy. Uh, and while we do touch on industrial and enterprise on this show, our focus is consumer. But it's been a long time, Scott, since we've talked about a consumer level 3D printer product that that caught everybody's attention. Yeah, and certainly it has, you know, it's probably got its its uh, its fandoms larger than it's ever been, but you don't hear about it as much, I think, for the reasons you mentioned. But also, I think this is actually a good sign. This is a sign that we are maturing in that space. And when it starts happening where the big money is spent on uh, the more of the corporate level or we're printing 3D rockets or whatever it is people are printing at that level and they're using titanium and steel and other crazy materials, that usually means that you're going to have a, as much as I hate the term, but a trickle down effect of the technology, just like we got when printers became a thing, you could finally, as an individual, go buy somewhere. And they were a little expensive at first, and then they got cheaper and cheaper. And the efficiency went up, what they could do, what they're capable of went up. This is true of almost anything. Kind of starts huge, giant mainframe computers, and now you're walking around with a phone in your pocket. Sometimes it takes a long time, but this feels like progress to me. And it doesn't mean that there aren't amazing things happening in the creator community or otherwise with personal yeah. 3D printers. It's just that we're now past that stage of this is a weird anomaly that only three people in the whole neighborhood have. And now we're to this place where, oh, my gosh, this entire restaurant was prefab by a 3D printer. I can't believe it. Like that That's progress. We're moving. There was a time, late 80s, early 90s, where personal computers 
faded away. There was, there was a lot of enthusiasm for it in the early mid eighties. Yeah. Personal computers kind of faded away and everybody thought of com personal computers as a business thing. Now you do that in a business. If your business needs it, you get the business machine and you buy the business. Compaq, you know, IBM, HP. Sure. Uh, and it wasn't until the late nineties, mostly with the internet, that everybody started needing a computer. And people were like, oh, well maybe I do need one at home even if I'm not Bob Business. Uh, so <laughs> I, I don't know why everybody's Bob today, but that's just too bad. I love it. Uh, I love it. So, so I think 3D printing is kind of in that same stage where there was a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of press around, look what you can do in your home for, for an affordable amount. Now there's all the people who were using Amigas, uh, the analog of them using 3D printers, you just don't hear about it as much. You know, we know someone who's in this business, maybe we can reach out and get them on. But if anybody is in there themselves, and an expert on it or knows a great expert to talk to, email us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Hey, a special thanks to Bob Coles, uh, one of our top lifetime supporters. Uh, we, we like to highlight the folks who have been contributing consistently over the years. Thank you, Bob, uh, for keeping us afloat for all these years. Uh, we really do appreciate it. If you would like to get your name on the show, you don't have to spend years and, and wait for us to get there. If, you, if you've never supported us before, if you haven't supported us in a long time, uh, start right now. Two bucks. Two bucks gets you all the month's episodes without an ad, and we'll read your name on the show then as a new boss. We're we're down 15 bosses uh, this month. You know we're hitting those summer doldrums. So now's the time to jump in if you really want to make a difference. Patreon.com/dtns. Thank you, Scott Johnson, for being with us as always. What you got going on? All sorts of stuff. Uh, as usual, I would just point people toward frogpants.com. Um, we now have a trilogy of game-related shows, shows that really focus in on different aspects of the video game world. A lot of that stuff we get to talk about here, and if you want an expanded look at some of those issues facing the gaming world, you can try Core, you can try our indie show called Boop, or you could try The Instance, which is pulling back and expanding and covering more content than ever. Uh, so go check those out. They're over at frogpants.com slash podcasts. And everything else you can find over there as well, frogpants.com. And if you want to just poke me individually, just find me on Twitter. I'm at Scott Johnson. Wait, I don't have to fly to nope. Utah and go to nope. your house to poke you anymore? Not like you used to. Not like you used to. Oh. You can now do it virtually, Tom, through the Modern internet. Modern technology. Yeah. Hey, we are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more about that by going to dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young again. Two in one week. What a pleasure. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Private Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>